In Romans chapter 8 here, starting in verse 28, of course, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And obviously the reason that God has to tell us this is because a lot of times it doesn't feel that way or we might not realize that all things work together for good. That's why God has to put a chapter like this and put scripture like this to remind us that one day we're going to look back at the events of our life. We're going to look back at the history of a church. And even though a lot of things don't make sense at the time, we're going to look back and say, you know what? Jesus led me all the way. All things truly work together for good. You know, I think of bad things that have happened to me in my life and just things that I thought I was doomed or just horrible things, financial problems, health problems. But I can look back and literally virtually all of them, I can say, you know what? Now I see why that happened. That was preparing me for something that would happen later or or that ended up actually turning out great. Boy, isn't it amazing how God worked that out all together. Now, let me say this, though. Things don't work together for good for everybody. There are a lot of people who end their life in failure. They end their life in shipwreck. Bad things happen to them, and it's just a disaster, and there's no silver lining. There's nothing good about it. It's just bad on bad. So I'm not up here to tell you, hey, everybody gets a happy ending. Hey, everything turns out great for everybody. Hey, all things work together for good all the time for everybody. Really? Because look around the world, and you know what you're going to find? The dark places of the earth are full of the habitations of cruelty. We could go to places today in Africa and Asia and even places within the United States where people are living a life that's like a living hell, where things are horrible, where people are, are struggling and suffering, and there's no end. There's no hope. I'm not here to lie to you and tell you that all things work together for good, period. Because you know what? If you go out and you live a life of drunkenness, fornication, adultery, whatever, and you don't get that right and you don't repent of that, I'm not saying all things are going to work out for good if you quit the church. I'm not saying all things are going to work out for good if you, if you leave your spouse. I'm not saying all things are going to work out for good if you go out and live a life of sin and debauchery and ignore God's commandments, I'm not saying all things are going to work out for good even though you never read your Bible. I'm not saying all things are going to work out for good even though you don't pray, even though you don't worship the Lord. I'm here to tell you that all things work together for good to them that love God. Amen. To them that love God and to them that are the called according to his purpose. And if you know in your heart tonight that you love God, then I promise you all things will work together for good. Amen. For those that love God and for those who are called according to his purpose. But you know what? You have to love God and you have to do what's right. You have, because look, loving God and doing what's right are connected. Yeah. 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 The Bible says, if a man say, I love God and keep his eyes commandments, he's a liar. Yeah. Right. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So what I am saying though, is if you love God, all things work together for good, even when things come at you that are a disaster. I mean, even when you get in that car crash, even when you get in that horrible injury, even when you get that sickness or illness, even when friends stab you in the back, if you love God, all things work together for good to those who love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. You know, most of the promises in the Bible are conditional. Most of the promises in the Bible, they have some sort of a attachment to them. Of if you do this, you'll receive this. You know, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Does that can, can anybody just say, well, the Bible says thou shalt be saved, so I'm saved? <laughs> no, because you have to do what? You got to confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and you got to believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And if you do that, thou shalt be saved. Okay. And then there are lots of other places in the Bible that say, you know, for example, be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So look, is that just saying everybody's going to feel peace? No. He's saying if you will go to God in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, if you cast all your care upon him, he careth for you. You can have the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, if you 
let your request be made known unto God. But if you ask not, you have not, yeah. right? So the point is, you have to do your end of the bargain here. You need to love God, and if you love God, then all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Now let's keep reading. He says, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now we know that God foreknew who would be saved. I mean, God knows the end from the beginning. God's already seen all of us in heaven. He's already fellowshiped with all of us in heaven. You know, up in, in Revelation chapter 7, when that great multitude's in heaven, and John is looking at that great multitude, we were all there, even though it hasn't even happened yet. John saw us in that crowd in Revelation 7. From God's perspective, we've, we're already in heaven. It's over. I mean, look, you can read about the end in Revelation, Right? So God knows the end from the beginning. I mean, God knows everything. So even before the world began, God foreknew who would get saved and who would not get saved. I mean, God knows everything. And so he knew that going in. Well, the Bible says that whom he did foreknow. And who did he foreknow? We're talking about the people that got saved. Okay, he foreknew that. He foreknew that I would get saved, that you would get saved. Whom he did foreknow, he also... Not only did he just foreknow them, but he predestinated them to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So he looked forward in the future and foreknew, but he has a destiny for us. He predestined us to certain things, and he predestined us to be sons of God, to be daughters of God. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So look, someday we are going to be conformed to the image of Jesus. Someday he will change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he's able even to subdue all things into himself. Look, it doesn't matter how bad things get in your life. It doesn't matter what the low point, you're going to heaven. Amen. Oh, my body hurts. You know, and you know, I have problems sometimes where my body doesn't cooperate and do what I want it to do. And in, in fact, I'm limping right now because this afternoon I was standing out in the cold for too long. And, you know, I'm from Arizona. I'm not used to the cold. And so I'm standing out in the cold in thin suit pants, and I'm standing out there, and all of a sudden I started getting, like, just this Charlie horse in my quad right here. It is hurting, and it just kept hurting more, hurting more. It was, like, tightening up. And now I'm, like, limping because, ugh, ouch. I shouldn't have demonstrated that. <laughs> but it hurts really bad. You know, our bodies have problems. You know, and I'm sure you got your physical ailments. I have a finger that slips out of joint all the time. You know, we all have our physical ailments, different problems, different issues. But you know what? Isn't it great that one day that's all going to be over? <coughs> you know what I mean? And, and the older you get, you just kind of rack up injuries. You know what I mean? Like when you're, when you're young, everything works. But then you, you get this injury, you get that injury. And it's just like you just rack up injuries and just start, you just stack them. And by the time you're 70, 80, you've just stacked up all these injuries. And it's just, you know, your body's getting worn out. It's just never going to be the same. That's why you got to get a new body, you know, when you get to heaven. So the, the, the point is, though, look, it's, it's not just like that with our bodies. It's just like that with our lives. You know, there are bad times, low points, physical problems, emotional problems, relationship problems, money problems. But you know what? We can say, okay, number one, all things work together for good to them that love God. So it's all going to work together. It's not even just that it's going to end up good. It's all going to work together for good. God's even going to use the bad things for good. I mean, think about it. Was it right for Joseph's brethren to throw him in a pit and sell him into slavery and lie about it? No. So you, you can't say, oh, well, it ended up good, so I guess what they did was actually good. You'd be like John Hagee where you say like, oh, well, the Jews killed Jesus. It's a good thing. That way he died for us. 
Good job, Jews. You did good because we needed the sacrifice to die. Isn't that just stupid? Look, yeah, yeah, it's great Jesus died for us. Hey, the Son of Man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It were better for that man if he'd never been born. Hey, Judas Iscariot would have been better off never having even been born. But did he fulfill Scripture? Did he fulfill a role? Okay, did all things that w work together for good as a result of what Judas did? Hey, it didn't work together good for him because he ended up hanging himself and then falling down and all his bowels gushed out, the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 1. So that didn't work out good for him, but it worked out pretty good for me that Judas betrayed Jesus. It worked out pretty good for you that Judas betrayed Jesus, right? So the point is, look, all things work together for good to them that love God and even bad things, even, even rotten things, even sinful things can work together for good. It doesn't mean God ordained those things. It doesn't mean that it was God's will that those things necessarily happened. But God can take any situation and it can work together for good. And plus, we know that no matter what happens in our lives, what's the, we know the final chapter. No matter how rough the road is, we all make it to heaven because if we've believed in Jesus Christ, we're, we're done. We made it. We're saved. Amen. Saved. The D stands for done. <laughs> saved. Amen. It's done. You're there. We made it. It's not like Pilgrim's Progress. Like, oh, man, we got to keep trying to get there. Got to get to that celestial city. Right. You know, we don't want to screw this up. <laughs> Beat me up, Scotty. I'm done. I'm there. I'm going. But you know what? Along the way, all things can work together for good, too. And then we also know that we're predestined to be conformed to the image of It's our destiny. He knew us. He predestined us. We're going. And then it says, moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who, what, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness <laughs> or peril, or sword, or, you know, a change in the pastor, or whatever. I mean, is that stuff going to separate us from the love of God? Look, if it doesn't separate us from the love of God, if we're still more than conquerors, if we're still on the winning side, if things, if, if we still, look, did we stop loving God? No. So therefore, all things are going to work together for good. For us, personally, no matter what. And you know what? Let's say the people around you, let's say they throw in the towel. Let's say they get discouraged. Let's say they end up quitting on God. You know what? You will continue and succeed if you love God. Amen. So even if people are falling out around you, that doesn't mean that it has to affect you. You know, I think back to my youth group going up, growing up, and, you know, I think about how many of those teenagers that I went to the same church with and heard all the same preaching with just made shipwreck of their lives and shipwreck of their faith and just went out and just lived a, a, a life that's the wrong kind of life. But you know what? Didn't affect me. Why? Because the promises of God are true no matter what the tribulation, no matter what the distress, no matter what the persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword. And what does tribulation mean? Tribulation just means trouble. You notice that the, the, the same consonants are there? Trouble, T-R-B-L, tribulation, T-R-B-L. Those words are connected. Okay. So any kind of troubles, any kind of trials, any kind of tribulation, look, it doesn't separate us from the love of God. Is it like, oh, well, I know I predestined you to be conformed to the image of my son, but I'm gonna re let's reevaluate that. Let's rethink that. No, nothing changes it. Your home in heaven is secure. Your status as a child of God is secure. The love of God is sure. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
And not only that, all things are going to work together for good to them that love God. Even if the guy next to you stops loving God, even if the guy next to you's love wax cold, hey, what about you? How are you doing? Because there's only one person that can destroy you, and that's you. There's only one person that can destroy me, and that's me. Other than that, I'm invincible. Why? Because if God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. If God's for us, who can be against us? I, I am invincible! Yes. Unless I self-destruct. Yes. I can self-destruct. <coughs> or I can conquer. No one, I mean, what, 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 what can outside forces do to me? They could beat me. They could incarcerate me. They could maim me. They could mutilate me and beat me and kill me. And what would be left would just be a beaten, maimed, mutilated, abused corpse. But you know what? They can never separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, my Lord. And, and I would be a conqueror no matter what. I, whom then shall I fear? The Lord is my light. The Lord is my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Of whom shall I be afraid? If God be for us, who can be against us? Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. Rather fear him which is able to, to destroy both soul and body in hell. You know, the Lord God is the one who we ought to fear and not fear man. And just realize, hey, if we love God, we keep his commandments, we're called according to his purpose. Hey, nothing can separate us. It's all going to work together for good. Amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for this passage, Lord. I, I pray that it would be a blessing. And Lord, I just pray that you would strengthen your people, Lord. Fill us with your Holy Spirit as we go, Lord. Guide and direct over the next few days. Guide and direct this Sunday, Lord. Please, Lord. Please intercede for us, Lord. We know not always how to pray how we ought. We know not how to pray as we ought, but we know that according to Romans 8, the Holy Spirit will make intercession for us. And so we pray that the Holy Spirit would take our prayers that we pray tonight and tomorrow and the next day. Lord, take our prayers and make intercession for us with, with, with utterances that, that, that we can't even utter, Lord, because we don't even know how to pray as we ought, Lord. And so please just take our prayers as we do our best to pray unto you and ask for wisdom and guidance and ask for your will to be done. Take our prayers and translate them to your perfect will, Lord, because we just want your will to be done as, as in it is in heaven. We want it to be done on earth as well, Lord. And we just pray that you would just bless Steadfast Baptist Church, bless the people, Lord, bless those who love you. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen.